Hello. Good evening. Good morning. Good evening. Welcome to another wonderful session of the live webinar. How are you, Nisha? Good, yeah. Thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. It looks like COVID is kind of getting better in Dubai and bad in India. And yeah, some parts it's getting better, some parts it's getting horrible. So wherever you are, please, please, please be safe to begin with. Yep. Yeah. Now today, I mean, we have seen a lot of Africa so far, um, and a bit of uh, Canada. But today we have somebody from uh, somebody who is going to show some colors from the South American part of the world. So many. From the tropical rainforest. Yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful birds, and it's full colors. It looks like. Uh, you know, painting done by nature. It's so, so rich, uh, so fabulous. And the collection of images, if you go to his social media profile, his name is Supreet Sahu. And if you go to his social media profile, the kind of images, oh my God, how many species he have captured so far. And every image is, you know, better than the other one. Really, uh, just give an introduction about postales and we'll start we'll we'll take it through yeah, yeah. that's better postales is a collective collaboration of a group of dedicated nature lovers to bring humans closer to nature through the medium of photography and art we have started this organization 6 years ago with our wildlife photography workshops to different locations. And then three other very verticals added, the magazine, events, and education. Now we are continuing with this live webinars, live reviews, and live photography exhibitions. We have done. 33 online magazines. Today, we are launching our next magazine, uh, which uh, Supreet is doing a cover story. We have done one international wildlife festival, 60 plus international workshops and lectures, 23 photography exhibitions. And recently, we have started with the online exhibitions, the virtual, virtual exhibitions. Because of this COVID, a lot of people are uh, finding issues in attending our exhibitions. So we thought of starting with virtual exhibitions. We have a collective social media followers of 1.5 million plus. We have planted over 40,000 plus saplings all over the world. And we have 200 plus international contributors who support us with their photographs, articles, uh, lectures, videos, etc. We also published two coffee table books. The first book was about 101 big cats from across the world. And our uh, latest book, the second book is on the species based in the Arabian Peninsula, which is called the Arabian trails. And today we are going to have a good session, an interesting session with uh, Mr. Supreet Sahu. He's a photographer and a bird specialist. Supreet started his love towards nature and wildlife at the age of eight. He started his photography journey with the Ashika 35mm camera that he used to borrow from his dad. Supreet is a very well, very well known photographer and a specialist in tropical bird photography. He has already photographed 3000 species of birds and the list keeps growing. And through his photographs and seminars, he tries to spread the message of conservation and how important it is to conserve these species. We are equally excited 
as you are to welcome this wonderful photographer and learn and improve our knowledge from someone like him who has more than 15 years of on field experience so let's welcome supreet hey everyone hey. good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you guys are and thank you so much for your time for the interview for the magazine and uh, it now it's connected the magazine is going live today and uh, you're going to share your experience with the audience with us and we are so thankful thank you definitely i'm really excited guys thank you so much for having uh, me here with your mic is not working i think uh, can i not hear you can you hear me now yeah no it's still not audible uh i can hear you can hear yeah disha yeah uh uh maybe you can disconnect and connect is it any better now headphone headphone harmis can you hear me yeah, yeah I, can. I can okay Nisha, can you hear me? I don't, I don't think, think she is. is. But is she able to hear you, Hermes? No. Yeah, yeah. Can you just speak on it? Nisha. Okay. So, if you are uh, connected with the platform, be connected. Because I, I'm getting an echo. Really? Um, I don't know what else to do here, guys. Because um, I don't know what I should do. Hello. 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 Echo. Yeah, that's yeah, what that's we are hearing. Uh, I think you guys will have to go on mute. Guys, let's give me one second, okay? Is it still, is the echo still there? It's fine, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah? yeah. Better? No, no. Okay. It's coming in. <laughs> oh, is it better? Uh, no, no. Yeah, I'm not sure what else to do because I make all my calls on this headphone, so. Nisha, yeah. can you use headphone? Is it any better now? Uh, yeah, correct. Yeah? Yeah, now it's better. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Technical issue, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nisha, so, it's good? Yes, it's good now. Awesome. Perfect. Excellent so sound. Sorry, sorry for the... No, 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 that's okay. Yeah. Let me just start with my screen sharing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Let's jump right into this then. Uh, I can go full screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, yeah. Guys, how are we doing questions in the middle of the presentation? You guys want to stop me and ask me the questions, or are we doing it at the end of the presentation? Uh, in between, if we get questions, I'll I'll stop you and ask the oh. questions, and then we can proceed. Is yes. that fine? Yes, sounds absolutely perfect to me. Yeah. Okay. So, a very quick introduction about me, but that's also the first slide. Uh, I just prepared the slide. A very interesting slide uh, shows where I go and what I do. Uh, mostly, all my work is here in Latin America, which is Central and South America. I do some photography also in North America, but primarily my work is here in, in, in the South. Okay, so here's what we are gonna go through, a little bit of introduction, uh, the thought process of my photography, some details about the technical aspects of my photography, and then we'll jump into some, some photo stories and then the questions. So, who am I? Uh, my name is Sukri. Uh, I was born in, in India, uh, in Orissa, and uh, I spent my childhood there in Orissa. And when I was 15, I actually moved to Bangalore uh, to my education in Islamia, my engineering. Um, I spent a lot of time around Bangalore, as most of the people who are joining already know, that Bangalore has some amazing places for photography, and so does Karnataka and all of South, actually. So I had some very good time, I spent a very good time there, uh, did a lot of photography. But I really had not uh, picked out what my niche is going to be, you know. And when I moved to the U.S. in 2015 and did my first trip to Costa Rica, that's when I realized that, oh, wow, there's a world out here that, uh, you know, a lot of people have not seen. And maybe this is what I love to do. So I just kept traveling uh, every few months because I was very close to Costa Rica. I lived in, in uh, Louisiana in a city called Baton Rouge. And I would travel to Costa Rica very often. I had a lot of initial challenges. Uh, like a lot of you would have thought, you know, the language because everyone speaks Spanish in Costa Rica. Uh, the food is very different. The culture is very different. Uh, so I had a lot of initial challenges. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go through the slides. Um, then what's my style? So that's where I picked up my style from, you know. Uh, and when I took a lot of pictures of these birds in the rainforest, I realized that this could be my style of photography because having a niche and having a style is very important in our genre of photography. I know that a lot of photographers like to go to, let's say, Africa and then India and then come to South America, Brazil. And then there's such a varied form of photography that people display. Uh, sometimes, sometimes people get confused, like, okay, what is his niche? Does he even have a niche? Does he not have a niche? And that's where I started working on my images to say that when people see the image and they're like, oh, that may be so pretty image, you know. Uh, and that's what I've been working towards for the last five, six years now. And the way I try to portray my work, it's uh, through getting those really nice backgrounds and very colorful birds with very nice light. And and uh, there's a sort of a trademark in some of my images where you can see and go, okay, that might be so pretty image. And that's what I've been trying to achieve for the last so many years. Um, am I successful uh, with that? Maybe, course, definitely, definitely. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's, that's my, are. that's my aim. Thank you guys. So, uh, also how I share my work, um, I think four years back, uh, when Instagram was very new, um, I thought, you know, why not just give it a shot? So, uh, I was still sharing pictures on Facebook and, and Flickr and it just seemed like the the your audience is just so stagnated with just your friends and family who are actually seeing the stuff and in i think in 2016 or 2017 i'm not sure exactly when it was weird i was traveling with my wife and she said you know this new thing called instagram you should try it out i was like on the phone who, who even cares about pictures on the phones you know she's like no no it's okay just give it a shot and at that time uh, i saw that people were just sharing their own pictures and whatever like whatever food they're eating and that's what it looked like you know just a food photography blogger kind of stuff and then i started taking pictures um, that's where i met some of the guys like jan wegner and uh, jc wings and uh, leanne very nice people uh, got some good stuff going on there then i also took over uh, a hub called planet birds uh, which has grown in excess of 250,000 followers now that's very, very yeah it's a big hub now 
and also my personal following has grown over 100,000 now. So that's also very nice. Um, yeah. Great to see some very nice people I've interacted with, made some very good friends uh, and learned so much. You know, that's what social media is all about. But we'll come to that. We'll come to the social media part, but let's go <laughs> to the to the work a little bit. So there's been a thought process always uh, in my mind uh, when I'm traveling or even when I'm not traveling. You know? uh, being a birder all my life has definitely helped. You know, but Whenever I see a bird, uh, I try to find out what species it is. If I don't know what species it is, then I try to find out uh, what species it is, uh, what's the behavior, what time of the year it is, and and how it's how it's reacting to humans close to it. Are is it scared? Is it not letting me come in? Is it staying very far? Uh, those kind of things. You know, it, it's very interesting. I say that because I just moved to Austin one year ago. Uh, I've never stayed at home for so long in the last few years that I've now for for COVID nineteen, and. In a way, it was good also because then I started building my own uh, hide in the in my backyard, and we got a lot of these robins that migrate throughout North America, and we actually saw the entire process of them migrating in, laying eggs, uh, having chicks, feeding them, growing up, and then the, the chicks have also fledged now. So that was that was very interesting. So being a birder is just an amazing experience, to be honest. Um, I do a lot of hikes in national parks uh, with no binoculars, no cameras, just binoculars. And that's where the question comes, you know, are you a birder or are you a photographer? I think, I think what's uh, very interesting and funny at the same time is that they're both, you know, looked at in a very critical way and it's understood that birders are a separate community and bird watchers are a separate community. For me, it's not, to be honest with you. I think they are the same kind of people. You know, it's just bird photographer is essentially a birder with a camera, you know, uh, who wants to take it to that extra step and just get some good pictures of it. And understandably so, because we see some beautiful birds and some amazing wildlife. So not taking a picture is kind of detrimental to the, to the fact that you are there in front of the bird or you are there in front of the wildlife. You don't want to take a picture, you know. Uh, that's that's pretty weird. Um, I was, I think, I was in Panama uh, in December last year, and I was with a group of birders, no photographers, just I was the only photographer, and we were there, and uh, we we seen some amazing birds, very difficult birds like anpitas, and I wanted to stay back to get some good pictures, and my border friends were just going. Check, check, check. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm like, guys, you have to wait. I need to get some pictures. We cannot, you know, just keep moving. It's, it's just crazy. I'm seeing those beautiful birds in front of me and you just won't stop for me to take a picture, you know? Well, it's just funny. It's just fun how we, how we interact. Um, but yeah, that's that's what a border, uh, being a border, being a bird photographer means. Uh, we walk a lot. Uh, there's a lot of hiking that needs to happen before we do the tours, you know, that's where I get to work with the locals so much. Excuse me. Uh, because they are the ones who actually know what's going on. You know, they are the ones who track the birds for us. They are the ones who know where the activity is. They are the ones who know what bird is in the area right now and what bird is not. Yeah. So in terms of behavior, that's those are the go-to guys for that. I mean, I do a lot of bird photography in South America. But at the same time, if you ask me, so Preet, right now, where is the where can I find this specific bird? I can't tell you the answer to that question. But I can take you to the place because I know the people who know the answer to that question. You know, so having the right connection is key to success in terms of photography. And I know that very popular photographer from UK, David Yarrow, he always says one thing that getting the right access is one of the most important things in wildlife photography. You know, if you don't have the access. You cannot get those pictures. You can have the most expensive camera gear in the world, you know, but if you don't have the right access, you just can't get those pictures. So, yeah, access for me in wildlife photography is one of the most important things, you know, uh, uh, to have. Um, the timing is very important as well. Like, uh, while we know that we can, let's say, see a resplendent quetzal, it's one of those beautiful birds, Nisha. I think I've shown it during the past, well, the big green bird. Uh, we know that the birds are there in the location, but what time of the year do they have their, their mating cycles? And based on that, where do we find them? That's also very, very important. You know? So these are some of the things that I take into consideration, locations, obviously. Um, but these are some of the things that I take into consideration before I'm making a trip or while I'm at a trip. You know, so that's some of the thought processes that I have. 
uh, when I when I went to Costa Rica for the first time, I think in 2015, uh, there are several things that I learned, you know, because all my time in India, the photographer, um, there was always a race for the best camera gear or best lens or the best tripod or the best feet in the safari. Uh, but when I started taking pictures here, I think uh, the whole perspective has completely changed to be, to be honest with you. Um, you realize that your camera gear is not the most important thing, you know. <laughs> you can take some very good pictures even with a 150-600 zoom lens or, or 200-500 zoom lens versus someone who is there with the latest Nikon 400mm 2.8 VR or Canon version 4, whatever that is, right? Uh, it's just that your understanding of the species, your understanding of the gear that you have is what is more important than the gear that you're using. You know? It's your understanding. Uh, and, and also the patience is extremely important. You have to be very, very patient. I have worked with so many people now who just want to get a picture and just keep moving. You know, they just want to do it fast, but that it doesn't work that way. You have to, have to, have to spend time. You have to wait. You have to give it some time because we are not there. I mean, the birds are not there for us. We are there for the birds or the wildlife, whatever that is. Even Nisha, I mean, Nisha, I mean, you guys can also attest to this, I guess. Even in Africa, when you guys are there, you don't, you don't get a leopard just out of nowhere, right? You have to wait. You have to spend so much time waiting to get those pictures. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing that I try to explain to people, you know, especially people come with very expensive gear, so they want to keep shooting all day, which is great. But sometimes if you want a really nice picture, you really have to wait. You know, patience is very, very important. Um, I think telling a story is also really important uh, when you're taking pictures. Even here, it's the same thing. Uh, taking, telling a good story is as important as um, the, the right equipment or the right knowledge about or what you're doing. You know, just getting a straight on, head on shot, um, you know, is not everything. I think there's so much more that there's habitat, there's behavior, so much more happening that you need to need to capture in that image. And that's that's why your image tells a story, you know. So those are some of the thought processes that I have when I'm taking pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak specifically to birds fair uh, because that's where my niche lies, you know. Uh, so this is an image of a saffron tucanet that I photographed in Brazil. Um, some of the things that I look for uh, when I'm taking this, when I'm trying to take a good bird picture uh, is uh, thinking these things in my mind, right? Like I have a checklist in my mind. Uh, what kind of perch is it? How is the background? Uh, is the bird looking towards me? Is there good eye contact? Uh, how much is happening in the background? You know, that's a very big thing that a lot of a lot of good photographers think of is how is the background. It's not just a thing in the foreground, it's also what's happening in the background. You don't really want a very distracting background uh, with not a lot of colors and not a lot of uh, yeah, artifacts in it, you know. Like if you see, if you let's say you see the same image, but there's a lot of branches in the background, you're not going to, aesthetically, you're not going to like the image, right? But now that the background is completely blown out, the bird is looking towards us, the light is good, the perch is beautiful. And now let me tell you guys something here. The background is absolutely natural. It's, it's not a piece of cloth. It is not an unnatural background, or nothing has been modified in Photoshop. I get that a lot. People ask me DM and they ask, Supreet, have you changed the background?" I'm like, no. Why do you have to change the background? You just know where to set up your your stuff, and you know that you'll get some nice pictures. You know. Uh, now, obviously, there are some there's still some artifacts here, like this little brown patch here and this little brown patch here. But there's only so much that you can do. You know. Uh, to get a bird like this on a mossy perch like this, I have to love this picture. Um, so these are some of the technical aspects. Uh, also looking at the exposure, the sharpness, um, getting the right colors is very important uh, because when we shoot in the rainforest, the, the light is actually not great. You know, uh, So sometimes we have to use a little bit of fill flash. Uh, like there was no fill flash used on this image. But sometimes you have to use a little bit of fill flash to get the exposure on the bird. Otherwise, it's too dark sometimes. Um, I try to underexpose a little bit uh, because I use Canon. And I, I personally believe that Canon, the right exposure stop is always a little under zero. So I don't know if you guys agree to that or not. But that's what I feel, at least in my camera here. So I'm always at minus one by three, minus two by three. Um, 
but when I see a setting like this, what I do is if I have a flash with me, I'll just dial down to let's say like minus one if the background is too bright, and then I'll just put a little bit of fill flash, uh, like at uh, one sixteen power or one thirty two power, just to let the uh, light the screen in front, you know. So these are some of the things that I look for when I'm taking some pictures. Um, again, like I, I think I've already spoken about this, the, the journey from a border to a photographer. Um, again, I'm not going to the details of this because this is a very interesting discussion and this can last forever, I guess. Um, but yeah, these are some of the things that we just discussed you now. What a border looks for, what a border photographer looks for, what are the differences, what are the similarities? And in my mind, I think there are more similarities than there are differences when a border, between a border and a photographer. And I think, I think it is also, uh, this is a good opportunity for me to clarify and I try to bring those two communities together because I truly believe that I, I am somewhere in the middle, you know, uh, because I see my border friends arguing with my border photographer friends and they don't like each other and they don't want to go boarding with each other. Uh, but I think they are very similar people, you know, there's, if you can just understand what we both are after, we are both after the same thing. Uh, I think we can all work together towards some of those goals. Yeah. That's true. Again, the same journey that I just discussed about. Uh, the, this one is uh, more personal for me because I went from being a border uh, to a border photographer. Uh, all this time, all this while, I had a binocular uh, in my younger days, and uh, all I could do was I could see all these beautiful birds, and I didn't have a camera to take any pictures. You know, uh, I had a small camera, but I didn't have that long lens. So I think back in two thousand eight or two thousand nine, I bought the 300 mm lens a fantastic piece of gear and that's when i realized that you know i can get some good pictures as well to document what i'm seeing uh, i remember one of my articles was published on india birds uh, in 2011 i think uh, it was an indian pitta that was nesting in hyderabad and uh, a lot of people had seen that before so i think i spoke to a gentleman named ashish Petty from hyderabad he's i think the editor of India Words and uh, he was really surprised to see that and you know that's what you find when you keep going and keep going out and keep spending time in nature with nature and keep searching for these stories and that's where you get some of these things you know it's just amazing uh, what's out there I truly believe that we still haven't explored 50% of the natural world you know of course we've seen where the tigers are we've seen where the lions are but there are these, these small things that's happening that we don't see, you know, on a regular basis. Um, and South America is just so big and it's so diverse that it's almost impossible to, to see 100% of it. Um, here's an interesting one that I get a lot, uh, you know, why do you have setups? Why do you guys like to shoot uh, at a perch? Why do you like to get those pictures? And this is a good example, you know, uh, a lot of I get a lot of clients, even friends, uh, who come down to South America to take pictures. And at the end of the day, what they want is they want some really interesting, nice pictures with very good background, uh, with very good colors, light, and everything. So here's an example of the same species. Uh, these are not the same birds, but the same species as a, a scarlet macaw that we shot in Costa Rica. And on the left, you will see a picture of a bird uh, on a tree. Okay, uh, It's a little higher up. And you see the background, how distracting the background is. It's a natural uh, background, natural setup, natural perch, and the background is natural, everything is natural. But see, there's, there's no connection that you can get with that image. Of course, it's a beautiful bird and there's no lying about that. But at the same time, we had a perch set up and the birds just came down. They were absolutely wild birds. And they came down and we got the picture of two macaws in the same perch. And the moment you see a picture like this, your eyes are completely drawn towards the one with the setup because it's just such a beautiful uh, image. The birds are in center, composition, and all those things are fun. Uh, the light obviously is not the greatest than the one on the right, because it's just the time of the day and you can't control some of that. But uh, aesthetically, it just looks nicer. You know? uh, do I have a favorite, to be honest with you? No, I, I'll pick anyone, because for me, it's, the bird is more important than just the perch and everything. But it depends what you want to do. It depends if you want the picture on the left or you want the picture on the right. I know many people who would prefer the one on the left, and I know many people who would prefer the one on the right. Uh, if you are trying to grow on Instagram very fast, you'll probably prefer the one on the right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you are taking pictures for documentation, uh, 
printing a book, you might want the ones on the left. Uh, but I know a lot of guys who have taken pictures for me for publications, they prefer the one on the right as well. So personal choice, uh, there's no favorites, there's nothing right or wrong, it's just the difference, you know. Uh, so just speaking a little bit more about setup versus natural, uh, how we do it and what we do. Uh, so just give you an example uh, of how we do in one of the lodges in Costa Rica and in Ecuador. Um, we know these places, especially the lodges inside the forest, we know the places where the birds uh, are, okay, or where the birds were when they were doing it 10 years ago. And what they did was they started putting out fruit uh, for the birds to come down. Now, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with birders and friends about the ethics of this, you know, of putting out food for birds and why or why not it's good or bad. And the argument is very simple. Uh, and even a lot of guys from uh, Audubon uh, who are good friends here, uh, they've explained to me that it is not a bad practice to have a feeder where you put out fruit. And here's the, here's the understanding behind that. I'm sorry guys, I'm not taking a little time to explain this because people need to understand the difference. It's very important why we do this. So when we put out a fruit, uh, let's say banana in this case in South America, the birds come there because it's an easy meal. Does it change the behavior? Absolutely not. They come there because it's an easy meal. Now, let me give you an example why they will not come down. When there are fruits inside the forest, birds don't come to the feeders. That's why there's a season for photography when we go there. Like for example, again, taking the example of Costa Rica, let's say. We only have a season, the season only lasts from November till early March. That's the time when we go there for photography of these birds that come to the feeder. The rest of the year, birds are all inside the forest. And why? Because there's a lot of food inside the forest that the birds can get. And they do not like bananas. Okay? <laughs> Contrary to the popular belief, birds don't come to the feeders because they like bananas. They come to the feeders because banana that we put out is an easy meal for them. And that's what they prefer. Birds, uh, they are evolving, right? They, they prefer something that's easier than spending a lot of time and energy uh, looking, for, looking for food inside the forest. But when the food is there in the forest during the breeding seasons like March, April, they are there in the forest. They don't come to the forest. So if you guys ever have the conversation try to explain this because i know that sometimes it gets very interesting some of these conversations about feeding birds again i'm i'm not a big fan of what we do with owls uh, in some parts of the world uh, but again that's that's what people there do and that's a very interesting discussion but live baiting is something that i don't do and i'm not a big fan i think they half kill the subject right like yes. the baiting during the baiting what is that? During the, when they bait, they half kill the, uh, whatever prey it is. So, okay, to full disclosure, Harvest, uh, I lived in Canada for uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, so I just moved to Austin last year. So I was in Montreal for two years and I was really interested to see the snowy owl, right? I lived there and I know that the owl is very close to where I am and I really wanted to see it. So I met some very nice people, uh, had some good friends there. And they said that Supreet will take you out to see some snow elves. Um, and the way they do it is that they just take uh, rats uh, or mice from a pet store and they just throw the mice on the on, on snow and the birds, snowy owls have unbelievable vision and they can see uh, a track prey from almost half a kilometer, even more than that, you know. And I was just amazed when I saw what they did, they just put the, the mice on the on snow and the bird flew in from somewhere, just grabbed it and gone, you know. Um, they didn't half kill anything. I don't know if that's a practice somewhere, but the thing is that the snow is so cold that the mice cannot run away, you know. When it falls down, when it falls on the snow, it will just move a little bit, but the snowy owl is so fast and it will just grab and go. Uh, but that's where I stopped it. I went there once, I saw the bird, I was happy, I got some pictures. Um, but uh, the whole practice was, again, it's kind of uh, interesting and uh, I just decided not to, you know. Uh, I am, my South America is better, so I prefer to stick to South America. But yeah, it's, I think I think baiting owls has been a very interesting subject for many, many years now. Uh, and I think even Audubon and a lot of other big associations have kind of 
banned that from entering compilations, even posting their pictures. Mm -hmm. um, on Planet Birds, I uh, heard a lot of owls die also because they are yeah, overfed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. High end. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, very uh, difficult subject to discuss, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. because uh, I think on uh, I think in Toronto outskirts they do that for uh, the green grey owls. And there have been some instances where we have heard that birds have, uh, hit, have been hit by a car or something bad has happened, and you know. But that's what happens, you know, when you try to get too close to nature and try to uh, meddle with it. I think that's yeah. that's the price that we pay. Um, but yeah, so uh, here are some more examples of taking pictures of birds on purchase. Um, and as you can see, there are some very nice pictures, a nice background. Not saying nice pictures because I've taken them, but because <laughs> it's just colorful birds with really nice backgrounds and really nice perches. And the birds are very colorful, as you can see. Because that's one thing that I really, really like about the birds from the rainforest is that they're extremely colorful. And um, uh, Nisha, I mean, if you're there, sometimes you'll see when you're there. And some of these common birds are just so colorful dashes of red and blue and purple and orange and you know just flying around it's like very fast moving butterflies you know it's it's beautiful um uh, the one on the right here is a multicolor tanager uh, from colombia it is endemic to colombia you don't see that anywhere else in the world unbelievable little bird uh here's the interesting one so let's talk a little bit about multi-flash photography uh now what is a multi-flash setup as you can see in this picture it is basically a setup. It's like a studio setting, but still in the wild. Uh, this is a lodge uh, in Costa Rica, in the highlands of Costa Rica. Uh, they have a hill here, and there's a lot of hummingbirds in that area. And as you can see, in the, even in the image, there's a, there are a few hummingbirds flying around. Um, and the idea behind this is to get very sharp pictures of uh, hummingbirds in flight. Um, and how we do it is we put five to six uh, flashes and we use a short lens uh, with the uh, autofocus turned off and we manually focus on the, on on a flower or on a branch whatever we decide it is and we place sugar water there and the birds start coming in and then we take pictures at very high uh, not very high shutter speed but at very high uh, flash flash speed uh, we use a technique called high speed sync. Uh, a lot of details on, on that is there on my blog on my website, sofreetsout.com. And it's hard to explain a lot of that yet, right now on this call. That might take a couple of hours, I guess. Uh, but the idea is very simple. Um, you dial down your aperture uh, to like f12 or f13 so that the complete scene is, is dark. And the only way the image is lit is through those flashes, you know, and even the flashes are shot at. Uh, 116 power or 132 power, which in essence is lighting the area for like one ten thousandth of a second, which is enough to, take to to get the full bird in flight. The reason why we use a background is because at that high uh, speeds, uh, everything is black, right? Uh, and the background will also be black. So we use a green screen or we use something green to get those natural looking backgrounds. Um, this is sort of a studio setup, um, and this is the only form of photography that we do where we get very nice pictures of, of hummingbirds in flight. And this is the only way to do it because a hummingbird flaps its wings close to 60 to 70 times in a second. You know, and if you should trying to get those pictures with your bare camera uh, and just very high shot to speed of one by 4,000, 6,000, you are gonna miss out because you will be shooting at the highest aperture you have, 2.8 or 4 or 5.6. And then you don't get the entire bird. You know, you, the wings are blurred, uh, the tail is, is, is blurred, um, and it's not a very pleasing image. So this is something that we do uh, only during our tours though. We don't do this, uh, like if I'm traveling solo, uh, actually, when I'm traveling solo, I'm not at the lodge at any point of time. I'm always inside the forest, you know. Um, so, just to give you guys some examples of what kind of images that we get from multi-flash, here are a couple of images. Now, the one on the left, like like this one, you see the dark background. It's because there was no background here. It was just the flower, the bird, and the flashes. So you see how the background has completely gone dark, right? Because we're shooting f12 to f14. 
Uh, here in the in this image, you can see the kind of settings that we use uh, on the bird. You know, we have uh, like what those flashes are set to, and and uh, what the camera is set to. You can see some of those details here. But these are the images that you get. This one is with a green background. Uh, and you can see the kind of details that you get, the kind of behavior that you get. It's impossible to get uh, with a bare camera and lens without any flashes. You know? mm -hmm. uh, moving on. So, I mean, go ahead. I have a question. Like, how 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 can you use flashes on long photo, long telephoto lenses? So these are actually shot with very short lenses. Like, if you see this picture, Hermes. Uh, okay. you, you can't actually see the lens here, but I'm using a 7200 lens here, okay? Because you oh. see the see the distance between. So here is the background, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? And here is the camera. So you don't even need a 600 here. All you mm -hmm. need, all you need is a shorter lens, uh, a short lens like a 7200, and you go to up to like 120 mm or 140 mm, and you can get you can compose it based on how you want to be, and you can get some pictures. Uh, now you can also do that with a 600 mm lens. You have to stand way back here, like okay. let's say in this picture, you have to stand like another 15 feet back, yeah. and you can still get those pictures. Because if you can see the pictures clearly, do you see the flash here, the where my mouse yeah. is pointing? Yeah. Just below that, you will see a remote here. Okay. Right? So the remotes are actually firing the 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 flashes. Now there's a remote here as well uh, mm -hmm. on the camera, which is firing the flashes through through these remotes. So it doesn't matter all, where all, my camera is. All of them is. are external flashes. Yeah, all of them are external flashes. Yes, correct. So and doesn't the flash disturb the birds? That's a great question. So I was coming to that. So what happens is that when we use these flashes, we are shooting at, like I said, at one sixty-fourth power, for example. You are shooting in excess of one by thirty thousandth of a second, right? So at such low powers, there is no way that the birds are going to see it or even get affected by it. You know, okay. if you're using a flash at one by one that is full power, then yeah. yes, there is a possibility that you're going to spook a bird. You know, and the easiest way to see it is or to notice that is when you let's say you take a picture and the bird just jumps, you know, just okay. does a little jump. That's when you know that the birds are getting uh, affected by the flash. But if you're shooting at this power, you will not see them do anything because they're not even seeing it. The other thing is you're shooting during daylight. You, this is not at night, right? Mm -hmm. So at that at that amount of ambient, with that amount of ambient light, the flashes have absolutely no impact. In fact, the bird doesn't even see it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the answer to that question because I get that question a lot, and I had the same questions when I started. Like, are these flashes not affecting the birds? But as you can see, I'm a, I'm, I'm I can already count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine hummingbirds here in this picture. Do you see that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so they are not at all worried about the flashes all they need is just some sugar water and they're good to go you know so yeah but this is this is an interesting one are we getting any questions on this multi flash uh, from our folks uh nothing so far okay okay excellent so move on yeah okay uh so like i said this is an example of a multi flash with a green background and without a green background so one is completely dark background one is the, the green background a uh, couple more. These are these both are from Brazil. Uh, so I used an interesting background here, the one on the right. It had some pink spots, uh, something different, you know, because it's you just can do anything with those backgrounds. So you can just try out something interesting all the time. We get some very nice flowers uh, from the forest uh, that the birds come to. So you can keep changing this. Again, this is a very artificial form of photography, to be very honest with you. And there's so much that can be done on this. It's just fun to try it out. Okay, uh, the next section is uh, where I speak about some of the pictures that I've made, uh, some images that are very close to my heart. And uh, this one right here is, is one of my absolute favorites. Um, it's a long term bat, it's a palace long term bat. And the way I made this image was, had to do a lot of plot with access. Now, this is something that I was talking about in the beginning of this presentation about access. And you know, and what you can do if you have the right connections and the right access to these places. Now, in the rainforest area um, between Nicaragua and, and Costa Rica, there is a there is a very very big Atlantic forest 
where uh, there's a lot of wildlife and these these bats are prevalent there and what they do is they drink nectar from flowers now because we had that knowledge or because someone there had that knowledge they started putting out sugar water uh, inside the forest for the same things that we the same ones that we use for hummingbirds and what they noticed was that uh, every day when they put it the next day morning it was gone right and they didn't know what was going on so one day they stayed back to check what's going on and they saw that the bats are coming in to drink the sugar water you know yeah it was it was amazing and with that knowledge then what they thought was that let's try doing multi flash because we know that the bats are going to come to the sugar water just like the hummingbirds and we can control that so what they did was they removed the sugar water and they put a flower and sure enough the bats started coming to the flower to drink from it and then we introduced the camera you know and then we got these pictures so this image is very different though because instead of using the 300 mm lens and standing little back and taking those images 300 or 7200 what i did was i took a 17 uh, 16 to 35 wide angle lens and i just put it on the flower okay and when the bats are flying in uh, i had this very low intensity flash in front of me in front of the behind the flower uh lighting up the of the bat so this was a lucky shot because these long tongue bats they take their tongues out just for a millisecond you know and when you're flashing your flash cannot refresh at that speed to go like 1 by 20 times a second it is impossible right no flashes can do that it does a refresh rate and i was lucky because that exact second when it took the tongue out i got a flash and i got the bat in focus now the wings are a little cut i know uh, but it is what it is you know, sometimes you just live with it so this was an interesting one i really like the sentence anything on this one any questions or anything no uh, i just got a message saying <laughs> we, we we are involved in your presentation and forgot to ask questions <laughs> <laughs> well guys feel free to stop me and ask questions you know because yeah. i i am i am very passionate when i talk about photography and south america so i can just keep going on and on for days together without stopping so feel free to stop me and ask questions whenever you get yeah. questions <laughs> all right thank you so moving on oh my god this is one of my absolute favorite so brazil i was in pantanal last year and uh, so in pantanal the way things work in pantanal is that we have a lot of boats that are always circling the river um, and uh, they they use Uh, radios walkie talkies okay they are all connected to each other and when someone sees a jaguar somewhere uh, they, they they broadcast on their on their uh, radios and everyone knows that the jaguars are there in that location and everyone just rushes to that spot so i was working with one of the senior most uh, guides of that area his name is alton and alton has worked with bbc and he's worked with a lot of people with steve winter he's done a lot of work with some of these people and i was working with alton and uh, alton got a message saying that uh, come fast there's a female lurking in this area we think it's going to hunt so we just went full speed and our boat was in front uh, and as you know just like the tiger safaris or africa safaris pantanal is very popular right a lot of photographers come there and there are a lot of boats um and we had a very short area to park the boats and those were the boats who would get the best view of the jaguar and alton was just so influential like uh like the big guys in nantumbo for example their jeeps would be at the right spot so he just made sure that we kept the right angle and everything and he said so quick just go to the deck put your tripod and get your picture <laughs> and like and people are yelling behind me i'm like all the bees manage man i just can't look, i don't know what to say but it feels bad but there's a big jaguar sitting in front of you and how can you not take pictures you know <laughs> the yelling can wait just take the picture so uh, and there's a female uh, she was hunting and then while it was hunting it just stopped and there's water everywhere like the behind the jaguar and in front of the jaguar the foreground and background it's all water okay there's a small patch of land that she was walking on and that's where she stopped and she just cleaned herself up and then it walked and then it stopped for like one second just to give us a glance because there was a lot of chaos and commotion because of the boats so it gave us a glance and then it just walked away 
So this was that moment and I was so excited that I had the angle to get it because a lot of people who were there in the back, they couldn't get this angle. So it was amazing. You know, Jaguar is a beautiful cat. And uh, I think fun fact, a lot of people already probably already know that Jaguars have the strongest bite force of all uh, wild cats, right? It's stronger than tiger, lion, anything. They have the strongest bite force. And when they hunt, their primary diet in Pantanal is uh, is the uh, caimans, the black caimans, you know, and the, sometimes the caimans can get really big. Caimans are basically a, a form of alligators, it's the same family of alligators and crocodiles. And what they do is when they jump into the water, the jaguar, they jump into the water to catch the caiman, they will actually pierce the skull of the, of the caiman. And that means instant death of the caiman. You know, that's how they hunt. Um, and only the biggest jaguars will will get the biggest caimans. Uh, most, the smaller jaguars, they hunt capybaras, uh, small caimans, uh, and, and some other things. In fact, I think uh, I've also seen a jaguar hunt an anaconda. Uh, a, small, a small male, yeah, a small male anaconda. Uh, these guys will eat anything. These guys are survivors. They will eat anything. Uh, they're the top predators. Every animal is afraid of them. Um, and yeah, they will just hunt down anything and everything. Fearless, fearless guys. Okay, moving on. Uh, one of my most favorite places in the world is the Amazon of Ecuador. Uh, this is uh, this is Scarlet Macaw again. Now, what they have there is very, very interesting. It's called a clinic, um, and every morning between six a.m. to eight a.m., Scarlet Macaws will fly down and they will drink water from this exact same spot every single day. And this has been happening for decades now. Maybe even more than that, we don't know. But now we know that every day they do that, you know? And every morning there will be people there. So now they have built uh, a tourism center where people can come and sit and watch this. Uh, they can take pictures, no talking, no noise, no phones, nothing. Just go there, sit there for a few hours, take these pictures and get out. Uh, this is the interesting part though. Like where these birds come down, there have been instances of jaguars coming down. And yeah, a good friend from Ecuador, Lucas, he has actually photographed a jaguar in this exact same location. Oh. Yeah, it's very, very wild. I mean, you can imagine, right? You're in the middle of the Amazon uh, and there's all sorts of wildlife, there, all sorts of wildlife there in that place. Um, I got a howler monkey last time with a baby that came down uh, to drink. So, yeah, so I've seen some interesting things, but a Jaguar would be amazing. Let's see. Um, one of my other favorite birds from South America, actually one of my top three favorite birds from South America, is this little guy. It's called a sword-billed hummingbird. Uh, very awkward-looking bird, but beautiful bird because of that amazing bill that it has. Uh, this one is a male, as you can tell from the chest colors. It's all dark. A female has... Uh, whitish breast, you know, and the male has a black breast. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, this bird has the longest beak to body ratio among any bird in the world. Okay, there's no other bird with that kind of a structure. And it's very weird if you actually look at the bird uh, to feed, this bird has to go through a lot, as you can imagine, right? Uh, it's very difficult. Now, a short uh, trivia about this guy the birds. I like to preen their, their feathers, you know, to clean it so that they can fly, to remove insects, to, to clean dirt. But this guy cannot do it with its beak. Most birds do it with their beaks, but this guy cannot do it with, it, with its beak because, as you can see, it's just highly impossible to do it with that beak. So it's funny that the way these guys do it is very interesting. They use their, their, uh, their legs to preen themselves. And it is one of the cutest things you will ever see because its little legs are just preening itself, you know? <laughs> and it looks so bad, it looks so sad when it is doing it. It's very funny sometimes. But that's nature, you know? These guys evolved. They found a way to do everything that they need to do. Yeah. Do, you, do you have a video of that by any chance? I don't, I don't actually. Uh, I think I, I was trying to take that video when I was in Peru last year and I, I missed it. But you know what? If I do get it next time, uh, I'll, I'll be sure to share it with you guys as soon as I get it. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, this guy is one of my most favorite birds in all of South America. It's called a redneck tanager. 
and if you can see the colors are just incredible on this little board i think uh, this guy is no bigger than my my thumb you know it's a very small bird very very colorful uh, very fast it, it just moves <laughs> like speeding light you know chick 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 and non stop and it's difficult to difficult to take pictures of uh, and at this instance i think it was jumping from branch to branch and i just noticed that it was using the same spot to land every time so i pre focused on the branch and i just waited for it to come back again and sure enough after 15 20 minutes it came and just when it was about to fly away it that's the behavior they just bob down their head a little bit and they just jump so when it was doing that i started taking pictures and i got i think two or three frames which were sharp and this was one these birds are all the uh, the native they don't move around right uh yeah they 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 don't they don't migrate now so they are in south america but most in brazil uh, i'm not really sure if they're endemic to brazil but yeah i think brazil the atlantic forest is the best place to see this bird okay yeah and this one is a male you see the bright orange and the yeah. name that's male the female has a dull orange so, so the background is natural or it's yes. uh, it yes so any 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 bird that you see uh, on my profile uh, nisha which is not a hummingbird even with hummingbirds i sometimes shoot with natural background if they're sitting or perched the flight ones i mean it's very easy to to distinguish actually the, the background if you like this this image that you see you see that there's some white some some uh, difference in color and you know difference in brightness you know that this is a natural background because if this was not a natural background it would be very very even you know the tones of the background would be very even but this one has some brightness of some white patches from the background some green some dark greens here some dark greens here yeah this is natural background uh, there's not a lot that we could do and honestly it's not even required i sometimes feel that it just adds too much uh, just takes away the, the natural uh, feeling of an image if you add a background again i'm not opposed to the idea because a lot of people like doing that uh, but at the same time do you really need it like in this image for example if i look at this image my focus is 100% on the bird itself right i'm not even thinking too much about the background and the background is clean and it's it's yeah it's not that bad um, i think i could live with it it's beautiful it's that that's yeah <laughs> yeah but you will be you'll be surprised that i still i have still have friends who would look at this and say you know what that background could have been better uh, what <laughs> yeah i mean that's true it's true uh, i post uh, on on some websites like uh, fred miranda uh, where we have we have a panel where we people people critic each other's work you know if you remember the good old imw days indian nature watch yeah. uh, it's very similar to that uh, but this has photographers from all around the world and people post from all around the world so i don't think i posted this image but there was another another image which was very similar to this and someone says oh the background could have been uh, more even and <laughs> i said it took me 4 hours to get a picture of that bird <laughs> and, but but see that's the thing you know uh, critic is good i think yeah. uh, that is missing a lot nowadays like you know people are just getting used wow. to wow amazing fantastic beautiful that takes away your your motivation to do better in life i think you know um and especially on platforms like instagram where people don't have much time this is one thing that i tell everyone that your picture on instagram for example has a lifespan of i don't know 25 seconds you know if someone yeah. is looking at your image for more than 10 to 15 seconds that means you have done an incredible job you know <laughs> no seriously think about this yeah, that's right that's right you know <laughs> that's you even on even i know that and i acknowledge that even on my pictures i think if someone is spending more than 10 to 15 seconds i think that i've done an amazing job and i should feel proud of it because yeah. the trend now is do i do you really love this image or do i just double click and move on to the next image so that the algorithm <laughs> thinks that i'm doing a good job and more people can see my image and like the image you know it's yeah. true that's and it's increasing day by day that that's how social media works you know uh, yeah. so yeah it is what it is but i i personally prefer a slight color variations in the oh, yeah. yeah it's you rather than plain green i 100% percent agree with initial like if you see most of my images you will not see one single tone of the background like there will yeah. be a couple of tones you know that gradient yes it absolutely adds a lot to that image i think it, 
Even with this one, you'll see that there's some bright patches here. Yes. You know, that is beautiful. Uh, yeah, it, I think it, it works, uh, but it is what it is. You know, <laughs> people like to. I had, um, wow. I need to share some stories sometimes. You know, I was in Ecuador uh, in January, and I had a very old client, very nice person, and he's a he's been an underwater photographer for many many years. And he said, Supri, these pictures are great. I love them. Uh, but the background has two colors. And I don't really like it. I only want green. I'm like, OK, <laughs> perfect. So just take the pictures. Let's take it home. And I don't Photoshop. <laughs> now, there <is> a, <laughs> now there is a new feature called select back, select subject. Just do that, invert, and color blue or color green. Done. <laughs> and then we laughed about it. It's just fun. Yeah. But, that's yeah that's modern photography for you guys you know so <laughs> this one uh i think this guy is the mascot for costa rica uh, the keel built to can uh, everyone who comes to costa rica wants some yeah. picture of this bird uh, and rightly so just look at the color of the beak you know that beak has more colors than the national birds of most countries in south america <laughs> so <laughs> uh yeah it's a beautiful bird uh people think that it's very common uh, they are not you know they are they are in a lot of places and you will see them on any trip but getting a good picture uh, with good background nice purse nice angle is not always not always guaranteed to be honest with you um, a small bit of information on this image uh, now this place where we have it between november to march or february i would say the birds come regularly because there are no foods there's no food inside the forest so the birds come down regularly to the, to the feeders and we get some nice pictures but the fun part about this image for me is the angle of the photography now we have a deck for photography where the birds come and if you're looking at this image if you were on the deck you would get an image where you just see the beak and and below the beak you wouldn't see the eyes because that's the angle so what i do is i always give because that's considered to be the best place of photography so the clients take their spot and I sometimes get a couple of pictures when I'm when I'm uh, leading a group. I don't do a lot of photography, but sometimes when I know that there's something interesting going to happen, I just keep my camera ready and I just pick up the camera and I just hand her hand hold it to get a couple of shots. And this was one of those instances. So what I did was I moved completely to the left, uh, completely out of sight from where the other guys were, and I had an angle where I could see the side of the face of the bird and I could get that this angle. You know, so I think in 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 modern uh bird photography in heights we still have a lot of room for improvisation you know just because the background is clean and the bird is in a perch doesn't make it a very appealing image all the time if you can get some action like this yeah uh, i think it adds a lot to your photography you know and that's where you have to think and that's where i think the experience comes in where you know that okay if i can move 10 feet to the left i can get this image i move 10 feet to the right i get a completely different image you know and these are some of the things that you should be willing to try you know, you have to you have to take that risk and try it out because you've already got a thousand pictures from one angle. So why not move a little bit to the left, to the right, and try out something different? You know. So this was one of those exper are, experiments. Are there birds uh, kept as pet? Where? In in Costa Rica? Yeah. I think uh, this bird was very popular on the pet trade uh, in the pet trade in North America, uh, okay. and people were capturing them in South America, but is extremely prohibited to to keep this bird as pet or keep any of these two cans uh and tanagers as pets anywhere in south america you know you yes. just can't the only way you can find some of these birds uh in um, uh, in uh, this thing in custody is when they are injured and they are being they are being uh, taken care of uh in in the hospitals or in one of those uh, rescue centers um, before they are before they are set out and back to the wild, so mm -hmm. that's the only way you will see them captive. Otherwise, you cannot keep them captive. There's very strong laws that are prohibiting people from doing that. That's great. Yeah, it's it's very good actually. Yeah. In fact, I think uh, last year we were in Brazil and we saw someone doing that in the middle of the just outside the forest in the middle of a small town, and we reported them. And I don't know what happened after that, but we mm -hmm. did report them. And they have they have uh, told free numbers to report these things, you know. Okay. I mean, just imagine, right? Like a country like Costa Rica is surviving completely on tourism. Like, yeah, yeah. if you have a negative review about something like this, the country's entire image is is you know in question. There. 
So, all right, what do we have? Oh, one of my favorite words is the highest in Macau. Um, I think this guy is from Pantanal in Brazil. Um, but I, what I do when I go to Pantanal is that I go to both sides of Pantanal. Now, a lot of people actually don't know that Pantanal is one of the, the biggest wetland. That's, a, that's something that a lot of people know. But what they don't know is that there's also a lot of other wildlife apart from jaguars, you know. And mm -hmm. when I go to a place, I always look for birds first. Even when I'm looking for jaguars, I'm looking for birds. And the guide is looking for <laughs> the jaguars. So hyacinth macaws are very common in Pantanal. And north of Pantanal, which is a one-hour flight from south uh, south of Pantanal, which is one hour right from North Pantanal. North Pantanal is where the jaguars are. And South Pantanal, there's a lot of birding like this has in the car. Very, very easy birds to photograph. You'll see flocks of them flying around all the time. And they are, I think they are the largest macaws in the world, I think so. Yeah, and I think high in macaws almost from head to tip of the tail, I think it's close to seven feet, six feet, something like that, big birds. You know, and they come down to eat this uh, uh, jakuru palm. I think these are jakuru, yeah, jakuru mm. palms, uh, the seeds of the palms, and you can make some very nice pictures of these birds. Beautiful birds, beautiful, beautiful birds. Look at the colors. That yeah, yellow. It's so yeah. striking. It's unbelievable. And Nisha, when you let's say you see this bird sometime, you will see at least ten of them flocking together. So can you just imagine ten hyacinth <laughs> macaws at the same place? And they have, I think, one of the loudest calls among any macaws, you know. All macaws yeah. are very loud. But this guy is just something else. You know, you just, you just go deaf in the presence of some of these birds. Beautiful, beautiful birds. Oh, good. Uh, oh. Another, another favorite image of mine is this false coral. Uh, this is a non-venomous snake. Oh, okay. Coral snakes are venomous, okay. Non, uh, false corals are not venomous. Uh, so this is the false coral. Uh, we shot this inside the forest, and I missed it. I just walked past it and I didn't see it. But my guide was with me, and these guys, as you know, they have some of the best eyes to identify uh, where the animals are. And I think there was a leaf on top of that, and he just removed the leaf, and this guy was just, you know, right there. <laughs> what a setting! Just look at the location and just look at the setting. You know, it's just unbelievable. And uh, yeah, just one of those pretty images that I like to share sometimes. So yeah, it was fun. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. You mean to say this was not a, with all this background, it's as natural. No, no, as yes. So this, I think this is the flower that I had added. But okay. other than that, everything else is just inside the forest, yeah. Even when you add that, the snake didn't move? No, because it's daytime. Where where do they live usually? Like undergrowth, in... undergrowth. So when you're walking inside the forest, so you'll see uh, very thick branches or dead leaves. And you, if you're scouring those locations, you can find them under those. Okay. So the, I think there was a big leaf and a big branch above this. And this guy said, I think there's a snake there. So just remove it very carefully. And I was, to be honest with you, I was very scared. Okay, because I didn't know the difference between a coral and yes, a false. Yes, I was about to ask you that. How do you mm -hmm. differentiate between the true and false? <laughs> so, so these guys, the guys, they understand, but I don't, right? Like, like, <sighs> yeah. So, uh, so now I know because now I've seen both of them very closely. So, false coral is much bigger in size. It's a milk snake, actually. Uh, these are much bigger in size. A coral snake is much smaller in size and much thinner also. Right, this guy is, is pretty thick, but the, the false coral is very, very thin and sort of very small head. Mm -hmm. And they look like a big earthworm, but the same color, you know, the coral snakes. But they do have a bright white patch also, I think, if I'm not wrong. I'm not a snake expert, so, you know, pardon me if I'm wrong. But, uh, yeah, this I just seen was unbelievable. And, unbelievable. Uh, and this during, during daytime, if you spot them, even if they realize your presence around them, they don't move. They just stay there yeah. like that. The thing is, the thing is, like I, I think you already know that the snakes they attack in defense, or most yes. animals would attack in defense, right? Yes. Now these guides they know how to deal with snakes, frogs, lizards, 
and if you're not disturbing them too much you will not see a reaction from them you know the problem is that people when they see snake they start freaking out yelling and throwing things at the you don't do any of that you know you just take it easy just very slowly remove the top cover and then the bug and the snake doesn't move and i had a macro lens a 100 mm macro lens so all i had to do is just stand back a little bit stand on on a wooden uh, on a wooden dead dead wooden branch uh, trunk i would say and then get that picture from top you know that angle i didn't go very close to the snake didn't disturb it at all just got a couple of pictures and then out of place for well, that this definitely looked like a complete setup for me yeah 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 like you know we yeah. had one of our one of our audience uh, siddharth chudasama he saying this image has a similar setting of a food photography oh, no, i was yeah, about yeah, yeah. it looks like a food photograph that's why i asked it that it very said so natural you didn't yeah. add anything it looks exactly like food photography yeah i know <laughs> it looks like a food photo that's why i did not actually add i, I don't take a lot of snake pictures okay i'll back up a little bit i take a lot of snake pictures but i don't post a lot of snake pictures uh but the thing is that again these snakes are also uh, are protected by law you okay. cannot keep them captive you know so to, to get something like this in captivity is highly unlikely unless it's a rescued snake mm-hmm. you know uh, but yes i agree with you the setting sometimes you know you take pictures and you know that someone is going to say that it's a setup but you know it's yeah. not <laughs> <laughs> beautiful beautiful picture and, everything and and if, <laughs> and and if it's a setup i would be the first one to confess that it's a setup there's nothing to hide you know like the pictures of the birds Yeah. absolutely okay. set up <laughs> but snakes uh, yeah we do we do take pictures of snakes in setups but uh, only a few species because we cannot take uh, we cannot i mean our guys they cannot keep them in capt- captivity you know it's it's prohibited by law in fact costa rica is tightening up on a lot of other things now like removing and not having hummingbird feeders also again that is also they are also bringing in that rule where they cannot have hummingbird feeders uh, at places even in lodges or all other places so that's becoming an interesting one yeah to be honest with you snakes is definitely out of the question because they do not allow snakes um uh, in captivity um the some of the common snakes like a fur lance uh, you can have that uh but you still need a license to do that uh, but these guys no okay you know uh two of my very oh. very favorite birds from costa rica uh the one on the left uh is a uh, resplen kexa uh very popular bird i think uh, and also i think considered to be probably the most beautiful bird in the world at least in the top 5 i would say um and i have to agree because it's just so beautiful it looks like a piece of jewelry flying around you know um this was a male and this image is is a sort of like 50% setup and 50% wild so what happens is these birds they don't come in to feed anything uh, from a feeder okay so you can't put a banana or you cannot put a fruit out and expect the birds to come okay uh what the guys have done uh, in this area is that they're very smart so they know that resplendent cats eat uh, the small avocado fruit okay so what they have done is that they have put some branches with nice perches not very far from the avocado trees yeah, so, okay. so so sometimes these birds would like to come out and perch in the open you know sometimes like one out of 10 so every 5 to 6 days that will happen like two or three times so the chances mm-hmm. are low but it happens and mm-hmm. it was on one such day when the bird uh, this adult male came out and just sat in the open and there was no one else there i was the only one there i think i was just uh, traveling with my wife and we were just scouting something and then he said gets up and then my camera was right there but i i always shoot with the 600 mm lens and i was too close so i had to back up to get this picture of the entire uh, bird you know it's a big bird and what happens is it's pretty windy it's a highlands of costa rica okay and it's very windy so the tail keeps uh, waving you know because of the wind and it was an absolute nightmare to get the whole thing sharp and in focus and the tail and head and everything Oof, it was it was difficult it's it's definitely as you said it looked like a piece of jewelry it yeah. is a, you should see it when it flies because the front of the bird is red you know like bright orangish red the chest so when it flies it looks like a piece of jewelry flying to be honest with you 
like really a piece of jewelry. Yeah. Uh, the other word that a lot of people love from from Costa Rica, from South America, Latin Latin America, is the king vulture. Again, vultures are not considered to be the most beautiful bird species in the world, as a lot of people know. But this guy is beautiful and it's got it's a white vulture and uh, got a really bright orange shredded head. Uh, and as the name suggests, the king vulture, they are at the top of the chain for all vultures. So if, if there's a dead animal or something uh, uh, that they feed on, like carrion, when the king vultures arrive, all the other vultures will move away, like the black vultures and turkey vultures. They will let the king vulture go in first. Like that's the aura that this guy, you know, brings in. So yeah, beautiful bird. Uh, I've seen some people sharing some headshots, and that looks like it, it. It's something different for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a difficult bird to get, and the headshot is just beautiful. It's got this orangish saffron yeah. red color, and yeah, it's a very very beautiful bird. Uh, this guy is a squirrel monkey, uh, very tiny, I would say a little bigger than my palm, oh. you know, small monkey, uh, very, very fast. Uh, this was in the Amazon area and uh, one of those guys came in very close. Again, I was just with my 600 and it came very close and I managed to get a couple of shots because it, before it was gone. So unfortunately, the tail is cut here, as you can see. But I love this picture because it was so close to me. You know, these are very shy, uh, very shy monkeys, and they don't come very close to you. Uh, they usually stay very high up in the canopy, mm -hmm. and uh, they would come down if there's food or there's another troop there, and they have to fight or whatever it is. Um, but yeah, this was interesting like, because this guy came down very close to me. Great. Uh, Wow. Headshot. Speaking of headshots, uh, this is a Toko Toucan. Uh, I think one of my most favorite Toucans. Uh, this is from Brazil. Uh, they are very popular in Brazil. Uh, and when people think of Brazil, this is the bird that they think of, you know, the Toko Toucan. Um, the bird as such, the, 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 the body of the bird is not very colorful. It's just black and white. But when you come to the beak, it's a completely different ballgame, you know. It's got this really bright yellows and oranges and fluorescent orange and red and all that and it's an opaque uh it's not an opaque i would say it's a translucent beak so when there is light you can actually see through the beak and you see these these become very prominent when you're seeing through the beak when there is light and it's an unbelievably beautiful bird to look at you know it's very very beautiful and that's sorry, a new information yeah um a lot so they are found all across brazil um but the best place to photograph them is in the pantanal now here's the interesting part a lot of people go to just the north pantanal and leave but i also go to south pantanal where these birds are very very easy to see and photograph um i think i had shared a video on instagram recently uh, a phone video there were 13 or 14 toucans in the same video just in one area just flying around making noise uh, amazing amazing bird very aggressive toucans are all toucans from that family all birds are very very aggressive you know if there is food they will fight and if there is food and there are smaller birds they will sometimes kill them you know oh. uh, yeah yeah there are there have been enough uh, records of toucans uh, feeding on hummingbirds um, mm. i personally have never seen one but i've seen pictures of mm. toucans feeding on hummingbirds um, I have seen them uh, taking away babies from nest and taking away eggs from nest because these are very opportunistic birds and they will do anything to survive. So eggs and nest, eggs and chicks, yeah, they will they will rob very easily. Yeah, I know. For such, for such a beautiful bird, such a villainous approach, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But that's what the natural world is all about, right? I mean, they do anything yeah. to survive. That's true. One, oh. of, one of my all-time favorites, the Margai cat from Costa Rica. Uh, I think this was also the cover shot of uh, Sanctuary Asia a couple of years back of one right. of their one of their editions. Yeah, uh, very difficult, very very difficult animal to see, and I don't think I'm going to see it ever again. Um, yeah, it was one such time where it was coming to the dump yard of one of the lodges 
in Costa Rica. And we had that information. So I flew in and we went to this place and waited for four days. Every morning from 5 a.m. to 11, we would just wait, wait, and wait. And I think on the second, I think on the third day, uh, when it stopped raining a little bit, uh, this guy, this guy came in. Now, Marbe cats are arboreal cats, which means that they only live on top of trees. They don't live on the ground, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, they hunt on trees, they live on trees, everything is on the trees. They are the only cats which can walk backwards while descending oh. from a tree. Okay? Have you seen? Sorry? Have you seen it walking backwards? I have not. I have not. This is good information on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> But no, the reason why they can do that is because their hind legs can rotate 360 degrees. Uh, so that's why they can do that. Uh, so we got that information. We went there, we waited for a long time, and sure enough, the cat showed up. Very shy, uh, but it do, it's not afraid of humans. So it would come not too close, but at the same time, it doesn't run away as soon as it sees you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, but again, we tried last year, nothing. Uh, Yeah, I've been there several times after that. I have not got, I've seen the cat move around, but we haven't got pictures like this. Like this hasn't happened after that. That's, That's nature. That's nature, that's right. So that's what I try to explain to people that, you know, it's not guaranteed to see and get the picture that I got. Maybe I was lucky, but that's what it is, you know. This guy is called a tiger. Uh, Very aggressive little creature from the Wolverine family. Uh, This, if you do, can you see the nails? Yes. Yep. These guys are opportunistic hunters. They will eat anything, absolutely anything. Birds, small mammals, chicks, eggs, you name it, uh, bananas, fruits, they will eat anything to survive. Very aggressive animals. Um, One of my locations in Brazil is one of the best places to see and photograph them. They come close to humans, they're not afraid. Um, And they would sometimes come and steal the the bananas from the feeders, from the birds. Um, and also, if they get a chance to get a bird, they will do that also. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just look at the face of this guy. So innocent looking, right? But no, they are very, very aggressive. Yeah, um, the last two images, you need to be very careful. Like, yeah, you yeah. saw a beautiful bird. That's right. One. That's right. <laughs> I mean, just look at this this, this guy. <laughs> How can yeah. you even say that this guy is going to steal birds and eggs? But yeah, that's what they do. Cynthia, Cynthia is saying they also have token in Argentina as well. Oh, yeah, same. they have. Argentina is absolutely beautiful. I've been waiting for quite some time to visit Argentina. Cynthia, you guys are living in a beautiful she's, country. She's there. <laughs> Sorry? Cynthia works, I mean, uh, we work closely in, uh, for the last six years. Uh, she's wow. a uh, contributing editor as well. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So she's that's invited. Amazing. <laughs> I, will, I will head down to your place soon, Cynthia. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, but yeah, there, there's two kinds everywhere in South America. You know, like you go from head to tail. Yeah. Uh, there's there's birds everywhere. Now the birds differ based on where you are, uh, because the rainforests uh, don't go up to I think uh, after Peru, I think Chile and uh, Argentina they don't have any rainforest. If I'm not wrong, Cynthia, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there are any rainforests down there because it's very arid. They are some of the most beautiful landscapes you will ever see in your life because Patagonia is in Argentina and Chile. Uh, that's where you get the pumas, uh, penguins, and a lot of other amazing birds and animals. Um, but I don't think they have as many rainforests as you would see more north, uh, in, in a more north to to Peru and uh, sorry, in Argentina and Chile. Um, you know. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is the same place where you got the where you saw the picture of the macaw earlier that was drinking from the clay lake. Uh, now these parrots also come down to the same clay lake, um, and this is one of those spots in in Ecuador where people go every morning and just wait for hours and hours for the birds to come down. These birds are very very shy, and when these parrots come down, they come down in hundreds. So. Just imagine you're on the place where you can't even hear what the person next to you next to you is telling you because there's so much noise, you know. And when the birds are there, they're just going crazy with noise and 
yelling and singing and you know just going crazy basically just to come down drink water and go away um lasts for i would say 5 to 10 minutes max all the birds come down drink water 5 to 10 minutes and they're gone and the place is just a desert after that no noise you know beautiful setting um uh, i have this video from peru that i would like to share of uh, me walking to the location where i shoot the marvelous spatula tail uh, now i hope that the video works for all of you guys i apologize if it doesn't but i really wanted to show you what the habitat looks like uh, the image on the left is the image that i got from this location after this walk so let me share this let's see if this works nisha yep Har harmis yeah no. okay so this is uh, this is the location that's where we walked and uh, we got this really nice habitat and we got some very nice pictures of this marvelous bachelor tail. This is endemic uh, to Peru. You don't find them anywhere else uh, in the world. You know, that's the only place where you find them. They've got these beautiful uh, tail feathers um, that you don't find in any other hummingbird that long. Uh, it's an absolutely amazing bird. Now let me show you the picture that I got after editing of the same image. So here, oh, oh yeah, God. absolutely natural, no background because you cannot you uh, the the place they don't allow you to put a natural they don't allow you to put an artificial background or multiple flashes. So this was shot with I think a single flash on my camera. Now as you can see, the feathers are not very sharp. You know that's the way to tell that the feathers are not very sharp and the light is not very good. That's why I was using a high ISO. You can see the the. You know. The specs, specs here. So it is shot at like I think four thousand ISO, very dark, but it's a marvelous spectacular even flight. You know what can you ask for? <laughs> it's an awesome image. Yeah, I, I love this image. It's a very beautiful bird, um, and because they don't allow the multi flash, not a lot of people have the image of this bird in flight like this. You know, they mostly have it perched on that perch, but not in flight like this because you just it's very difficult to take that picture. And to get a nice green background, so yeah, yeah, lucky, lucky me. So let's see. Okay, moving on. Uh, just sharing some pictures from some of the trips that I do. This was a group that I was leading, I think, last year to Costa Rica. Uh, we have folks from the US, from India, uh, from Switzerland. Um, me and my guide are back there. Um, as you can see, I don't use a tripod when I'm with the group. I keep my camera with me just in case something interesting comes up. But there's not a lot left to shoot for me in Costa Rica, to be honest. So <laughs> don't get a lot of pictures. Uh, but these guys were very happy that day. We got uh, a very beautiful mot mot. Uh, it's a beautiful bird. Uh, it's a shame I don't have a picture right now to share. But they got the bird inside the forest. Now, what I do on my tours is that I don't dedicate 100% of the time at feeders, you know, because when you do that, you actually miss out on a lot of stuff that's happening inside the forest. So we kind of divided by 70 to 30 ratio, where 70% of the time people can shoot at feeders. And 30% of the time is when we explore and we get some of the more interesting stuff, like the owls, trogons, moth moths, and uh, the, the little white bats that I take pictures of. Uh, so we do that. So this is one of the trips. I do several trips like this. This was one of the trips where we were just coming out of the forest. And we got this picture of everyone very happy, you know. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little bit about the conservation side of things, guys. Uh, something important to share. Uh, the, when we work with the people uh, in Latin America, we make sure that a chunk of the, the profits goes directly to the people that work with us because they depend entirely on tourism. Uh, this yeah. is what they do. Uh, a lot of them were hunters in the past, and a lot of them would do things to keep things, uh, keep the fire on. And I totally understand that. But a lot of them, I think a major major chunk of them have now turned to conservation. You know, and they believe in conserving everything. And you can see the little kid on the left. We were taking pictures uh, of, of one of the birds. And this group of kids were coming back from the school. And they were also excited to see the big camera. So they came running in. And so I gave him my binocular to, to just see. And he was so excited. It was, it's amazing to spend time with local people, you know. And on the right, you see this is a place called Limon Cocha in the Amazon of Ecuador. And uh, these are the government officials that work there. Very hardworking people, uh, you know, very down to earth, very nice people. They know everything that's happening in the, in the forest. 
and it breaks my heart right now with the whole coronavirus thing. They yeah. just don't have a lot to do right now. And I think in April, I had started a, a fundraiser to help a lot of these people. And a lot of people have contributed to that. And those funds have gone 100% back to the to the people. And they're, they're very happy about it. And they've been very thankful about it, you know, uh, because we all tried to help. But I'm really hoping that this uh, vaccine comes out soon so that Same, yeah. everyone can, you know, start living their life again. Because it's just taken everyone to the dead end now. So just to wrap this up, I just wanted to share my vision at the end. Um, I believe that sustainable tourism uh, that also aids conservation and drives awareness is my my way to go. Uh, wildlife photography is one way of doing that. Um, and I truly hope that my pictures uh, can share some of those stories, can share some of the ideas that I have in mind and share some of the vision that I have in mind for these locations. You know, people through awareness will understand how we can conserve uh, the rainforests here in South America. Uh, a lot of them are hurting right now, especially places like Brazil. And you can see political problems. The Amazon is getting destroyed every single day for cattle farming. Um, places are going through a lot right now, you know. And if we can do a little bit to help, then that's great. Then it's a success. If through this call today, if five people are motivated to understand about the rainforest in South America, my job here is done. So I thank you guys, you know, Nisha, you and Hermes. You guys have been doing an amazing job. So thank you so much. And it, the whole idea is that, dear. I mean, you know, what you by supporting people in the the fundraising activity and the images, everything. Right. We all we all are working in the same direction, and that's yes. the that's the whole intention, you know. Spread yes. people, spread more awareness and peace to more people. Right. No, I think I think this was this was a good session. I was really looking forward to it, Nisha. Thank you, Hermes, Nisha, and Hermes for inviting me here. Um, I try to share whatever I've learned over the years with everyone through any platform that I get, and to do it on such a big platform like yours, it's great. You know, um, I'm open to any questions. If you guys have any questions at this time, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, more than questions, like everyone is saying, you have explained it very well that they don't need to ask anything thank so, you thank you that's that's big you know yeah I, you know i breathe i breathe and live south america so you can wake me up at like 3 a.m in the night and i'll just i'll just blabber you know parrots and macaws and two cats and tanagers <laughs> all night so that's what i love you know i just i have this emotional connect with south america so i can talk about it any day anytime the, uh, we can definitely understand it. So yeah. beautiful in your talk, uh, uh, the way you express it, and in your images, there is the you know you don't somebody don't you don't need to talk about it. It's, That's it's right. that obvious. <laughs> thank you so much. It's, a lot of lot of uh, comments like we we thank you for giving such valuable information and classes for zero cost. It's free, you know. It's that's yeah. one thing that I try to tell people that sometimes you just don't charge for those things. You know, you, you have to share what you have for zero cost. I'm sorry, but I'm going to take one more minute from you guys just to share something from my past. In 2015, when I first wanted to visit Costa Rica, I had a lot of trouble because there was no information on the internet of where to go and what to do. No one was willing to give me that information of how to do it. Um, and the best and the closest that I, I got to was when I talked to someone who had been there in the past and he then asked me to talk to another tour operator in Costa Rica and that's when I said and then he said oh I'm going to charge you so much money and I'm like but what do I get out of that money that I pay like I don't mind paying you that money because of the expertise and he said that oh we'll do a lot of multi-flash and, and free years. and I said you know what that's not what I want to do so Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything, but I'm going to go out and do this research myself and find out what's going on. And I just did it, you know, and that's why the whole idea of starting this company of Tropical Photo Tours was to help people to get those things at a cost that is not astronomical. You know? And uh, and I think that's why it's doing so well. We get a lot of clients who want to do these, take these pictures and see these places because not a lot of people are doing that right now. 
Yeah. That was the aim, you know, because I have been with the video game industry for 15 years and I just quit last year to be full time into Tropical Photo Tours because it was getting the, the work was getting more and more and I thought, you know what, this is my career now. I want to do this, you know, photography, wildlife, something like that. So I talk a lot sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can totally understand because we are kind of going through the same journey oh, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And Postrels is doing amazing. Congratulations to you guys. You guys are doing a terrific job with Postrels, you know. Uh, I got a message yesterday in one of my WhatsApp groups saying, hey, Supreet, I think you're going live with Postrels. I'm really excited to see you. I said, yep, that's right. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Man. Awesome. Happy, happy, happy singing saying, Postrels, please convey my hello to three masters who who inspire me to go and highlight photography. Wow. Thank you, happy singing. Thank you, happy. Thank you. Uh, multi flash photography of hummingbird is a really good experience. I had amazing time doing that with Supreet at Costa Rica and Ecuador. Bubinder Randhawa. Hey, Bubinder, yeah, one of my favorite guys. He's a great photographer himself and he has learned so much. I think we have done three locations together already. We did Costa Rica, Brazil, and Ecuador. And the way he gets those pictures is amazing. And I can see the change in his photography when he first came. For the first trip to what he's doing now it's just unbelievable and you know that's the journey that you go through you keep doing these pictures and you keep doing these trips and your world just keeps getting better and better and recognized more and more right? and Bupinder is a very nice guy so, so hey Bupinder wherever you are that that's um, that's always happy to see you know people who come with us and um yeah in their way it's that's that's the whole that's the that's the that's the soul of it yeah, so you're right, Nisha. I think the seeing the happiness when someone gets a picture that because people see all these pictures on social media and they say, Oh my god, what if I had that picture on my in my portfolio, you know? And when they come there and they get that dream shot of that toucan or the tanager and they say, Oh my god, this is what I wanted to do. And you see the happiness in that face, and there is yeah. nothing that compares to that. You know, there's no paycheck or nothing that you do in your yeah. mind to very job and compared to that happiness. Yeah. yeah. People and, ask me that question a lot, you know, that why do you leave a nine to five job to do this? Yeah. That's the answer that I give. Sorry, I'm going to go ahead. Khaldun Aldeve from Dubai is asking, you were showing that bad picture, right? Right. So during that time, uh, did the bad got hit by the flash? No, no, not at all. The same concept, uh, but you have to also understand that bats at night, when they fly, they don't fly with vision. They use sonar to fly. Right, so yeah. bats actually are not seeing what you are seeing. They're using sonar to detect their path and to detect where they're moving. So they are not seeing the flashes at all. You know, in fact, you do that with very bright light. Also, they will not be affected. It's just that we have the responsibility to not disturb them beyond a point that we don't use light in those locations. It is okay. completely dark. From the place where we take those pictures, it is dark as hell, and it is scary because we have to do it inside the forest in Costa Rica because that's where the bats are and the chances of a snake biting you is very high so we wear very long boots uh and we are always very careful so there's one guy who's always looking on the ground if there are any snakes or anything they have a little torch where they're checking if the snakes even jaguars the place has jaguars so yeah it's it's not the it's not not the most uh, enjoyable photography experience but the outcomes are just unbelievable because if you can get a sharp picture of a bat in flight I think there, there are a few things that can make you as happy as, you know, getting a bat in flight because they're difficult. They fly very fast and all the pictures are just intuition, you know. We know that the bats are flying in. We just keep clicking with a very, very uh, soft focus light, uh, which is just giving us an impression that the bats are coming in. That's all we know. You know, we don't know exactly when the bats are coming in. So, and the bats are coming very fast to the flowers. And it is with intuition that we are taking those pictures because you cannot shoot with the flashes. You cannot shoot twenty frames per second. You have to go three or four frames per second. That's true. That's true. And uh, Mukund Kumar from Dubai is asking, what is the camera settings you use for bird photography while they are perched and while in flight? Uh, different settings. So when the birds are perched, I usually try to get. Um, a, a small aperture so that I can cover the birds so like an f7.1 or f8 because sometimes the two kinds of big birds and to get the full bird in focus you need a bigger aperture um, 
a small aperture. Sorry. Uh, so that's what I use when I'm. Uh, that's what that's kind of setting that I use when I'm taking pictures of birds and perch. Flight completely different. I used the highest aperture, so 2.8 out of f4. Um, if I'm shooting with my 600 f4, and I try to get very high shutter speed so that I can I can catch the bird in flight. Now with the technology evolving, with all these mirrorless cameras, I think flight photography is a joke now. You know, and like it's so easy to take pictures of birds in flight now with the mirrorless cameras and you know, the new Canon launching it. It just becomes so easy. But in the older days, with the 70s and with the 5Ds, absolute nightmare. I think Nisha can attest to that. Yeah, definitely. Ridiculous. Yeah. But but that's the idea. I think having a high shutter speed is important no matter what you're shooting, either a bird is on perch or a flight, so that you get the bird sharp. The idea is to get the bird sharp, you know, especially the eyes and, and the head, you to get it sharp. Uh, flight is the same story, but it's always very difficult because your focusing system is different. I know I, I've been a Canon guy all my life, but I always say this to people that Nikon is way superior when it comes to autofocus than, than Canon. You know, if you're on a D5, your chances of getting more pictures of the birds in flight than if you're on a Canon 1D. It's, it's, it's the truth, you know. A lot of our Canon guys don't agree to that, but it's the truth. Canon now, guys the, are going to be on your neck. No, no, that's fine, that's fine. Because I'm going to say something now that's going to make them happier is that if you're on a Sony, then you're going to get more pictures than Nikon guys do. <laughs> so, so, but, with, but with the new, the, I think I was reading the new reviews on the R5, Canon R5, and that thing is absolute beast, I think. I think they have not a chance to test it. I, I, have, I have no idea. I heard uh, that a lot of people have done that, and this is an absolute beast. But see, that's what technology is bringing in nowadays. Now, because there's a place in Costa Rica where we shoot Macos in flight, uh, and it's very predictable flight pattern that they have, so we get a lot of pictures. But uh, I was there last year with a group, and one of them was using a, a Sony A9, and he would get at least six to seven pictures out of ten pictures, whereas the Canon and Nikon guys they were getting like two to three pictures sharp, you know. So it's a, it's yeah, it's it's very very yeah. funny and it's weird. Yeah, that, that competition is always good between the brands so that we get better results. The only That's thing true. is the frequency they're coming up with new new stuff That's true. is very new too. I, I have been a Canon guy all my life, but I don't have that feeling of I hate Nikon or I hate Sony. That has never happened to me because I shoot all the gears. Uh, and I think that there are some things that Canon is very good at and there are some things that Nikon is very good at. There's something that Sony is very good at, but I True. don't think I'm a Sony guy, but I would prefer Canon or Nikon most of the time. Uh, but I would pick anything. I would pick a Canon or Nikon based on where I am, and I want to shoot with them. They're both That's excellent gear. Yeah. yeah, the same here. I mean, um, I started with Nikon, then I was using uh, Canon for um, six, seven years, then I got back again to Nikon. Yeah. Uh, people, and I have friends who really, you know, fight for the brand. Then I find it quite funny because you know it's it's not camera definitely have its role but then end of the day it's the person the way you see it and it's a lot of things to do with a vision or a dream or the way you pictureize it the way i the way i say the way i say to people i explain to people is that you will never have a carpenter you know brag about his saw and his tools you know because it's a tool you know, they will not say, look, I have the, the best saw in the building. I have the best tool to cut wood. Because that's a carpenter. That's what it does. We are, we are photographers, right? We take pictures. So having a good camera is what is what is expected out of us, I guess, right? Yes. So we shouldn't be arguing about how many frames per second this camera is going to do and how much ISO you can shoot. If you're a good photographer, you will take good pictures no matter what it is. Yeah, that's true. That's so, true. yeah. So we, we have one more question from uh, the same thing from Hari Wari Jackson. What do you consider the most aspect in bird photography? Is it aperture or shutter speed? Sorry, could you repeat that? Huh? What do you consider the most important aspect in bird photography? Is it aperture or shutter speed? It is the picture itself. You know, uh, it is not the aperture. It is not the shutter speed. You could shoot. In, you can shoot either of them and you can get very good pictures. The understanding of what setting you should use to get the picture is what should matter, you know. Uh, I I shoot, I shoot mostly, I, I know that a lot of people say that it's good to shoot manual and you can control everything. 
blah, blah, blah. You are in the forest. You are in front of birds that are flying so fast. Yeah. It, is, it is impossible to change your settings in manual when you are there. I would shoot, I would change from aperture to shutter speed and shutter speed back to aperture based on the situation that I'm in. You know, I see a steady bird, I would shoot aperture. I see that there's a lot of action happening. Maybe I'll shoot to, I'll, I'll switch to shutter speed. It doesn't matter. If you understand, the thing is, you have to think what kind of image you want. You know, once you have that image, you have to work backwards to understand what settings you need. You look at the environment around you, you see the air, you see the light, you see the behavior, you see a lot of these things, and that's when you decide, okay, I need a flight of this two cam. This is what I'm gonna use. It's a big bird, so I obviously don't want to shoot f2.8 because that's gonna get very little of the bird in focus. I need a smaller aperture, so I need seven, no, I need eight, right? So you take that into consideration. Now, based on that, what do you do? Do you shoot aperture or do you shoot shutter speed? Now you could go manual as well, you know. So it depends on the situation that you are in. And that's why understanding the gear you have is more important than getting the best gear in the market. That's so true. so yeah, the, I'm sorry if that's not the right answer that you're looking for, my friend, but uh, <laughs> there is no right answer to this. You know, there is and there is an analysis that you have to understand. And once you know what the analysis is, you will make those pictures based on whatever yeah. mode you are in. Yeah. Uh, again, how you want to add? Uh, do you want to add a bit of habit? Or do you want a creepy Correct. background? So yeah, all these things right. matters. That's it really right. depends on the situation and uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so Chintan Goel from Kenya is saying, "I've seen your Instagram where birds land on your hands. How do you do that? Where, where I am, every bird flies away when we get close. Frogs <laughs> want to be close." Chintan, Chintan, Chintan. So. Uh, yeah, that's. The, I think that's a great question. I was kind of waiting for that, uh, but I'm glad that you asked it. So this doesn't happen everywhere. Uh, this happens at very specific locations, especially in Brazil. Uh, there are a couple of locations where the birds have gotten very used to doing it. Uh, one of the lodges uh, has been around for almost 15 years now, and the birds have been coming to that lodge ever since, right? Uh, and the way it works is that those forests are completely out of fruits during the winter season. So June, July is when there's, it's winter in South America, so Brazil is winter, and there's absolutely nothing there. You know, they're desperate for food. And the bird um, population is very high there, right? Mm. So you would get like 20, 25 parrots at the same spot fighting for like two grams, you know? So the competition for food is very high. Uh, we take a little bit of advantage of that, to be honest with you, and by the time we come out to put the fruit down, they are already on our hands, you know? And that's when I thought, you know what, that's probably an interesting avenue to try and get some phone footage, you know, instead of using DSLR, to just shoot with the phone. And I think that went pretty viral on Instagram and on some other platforms as well, of these parrots coming in and feeding from my hand. So I just had a banana in my hand, the parrots came in, and sometimes toucans come in, Oh. Yeah, yeah, the two cats will come in. Uh, there are some other birds also, like the non birds, and some of those birds also come in. It's 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 very very interesting uh, because that behavior doesn't happen everywhere. I think there's one place in Costa Rica where a little bit of that happens, but not a lot. But I think I think Costa Rica is one of the places. Even Ecuador is one of the places where that happens, but with different different species. You know, uh, there is a place I think in Colombia. Where the hummingbirds will come and land in my hand, in Ecuador, where the hummingbirds will come and land in my hand uh, and feed from my hand, you know, that's some, and some difficult hummingbirds. So, yeah, that has been a very interesting experience uh, to get to see those birds from that close distance. And yeah, it's it's very, very good, you know, it's, it's so much. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm really looking forward for the trip which we discussed. And Absolutely. In in fact, after um, posting your images yesterday, I mean, uh, with this particular talk and the posters, I already got a couple of friends from India said next time when I'm traveling, they want to join us. So let's see yeah. how it goes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. And um, have we any more questions in FB or? Uh, 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 we have one question from Kalpana Tiranjan. Do you feel the wildlife and forest of Amazon are shrinking rapidly? Oh, yeah. yeah. Unfortunate, but it's true. They are shrinking, shrinking very fast at an alarming rate. Now, to understand a little bit about the Amazon, the, 
the river flows through a large chunk of South America. And South America is a big continent and it's a very big river, you know. And the river has tributaries as well. So it's not just one river. So, for example, uh, the Amazon flowing to Ecuador has several tributaries and one of them is called Napo. And there is so much happening on these tributaries that is destroying that. Uh, cattle ranchers in, in Brazil are, are taking over the Amazon. Uh, for cattle ranching, they have to convert those plants, and there's a lot of species left, lost, lost, a lot of habitat loss. Amazon is shrinking, and it's sad, and I don't know what we can do because with the coronavirus happening, a lot of things have been locked down, and that gives poachers a chance to do more of what they were doing, you know, without anyone looking at them because everyone is worried, worried about coronavirus. And yeah, it's a very scary time to be alive, to be honest with you. And the Amazon in Brazil, especially, is shrinking very, very fast. I think that's the situation across the world. Every, you know, uh, the the negative activities are actually on a yeah, higher pitch. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. everybody's uh, taking it as a positive sign to do whatever nonsense they want to do at this time. That's true. That's human right? I mean, we are probably the most culpable species on the planet, and uh, you only culprit. I mean, the rest uh, of the yeah. damage, any other species, the damage they are creating is. Yeah, nothing in front of what we do as humans. What we do is hilarious. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you guys got a chance to look at all these interesting viral images from places like Kerala and some of the other places where these animals have started coming back into the cities, you know, because there's no movement and there's not a lot of human Excuse me. Yeah. It's amazing, right? It's just unbelievable. Yeah, and there are accidents again once things yeah, get like getting in back to normal. I mean, now it's back. It, it's again worse. But in between, there were very bad incidents too in Kerala specifically, which is very sad. That's true. Uh, but that's that's humans, and and that's where we hope to touch some people at least. At least you know, uh, a, a small percentage or people, if we can yeah. give the right guidance or. Yeah. At, at least to the first step, if you can lead to someone. Every little bit helps, you know. So just keep trying and just let keep working together. Just every little bit helps. Yeah. But, yeah one last question from Acha Netaji. Uh, uh, can you give a best suggestion to get a creamy background? Use the highest aperture that you have. So if you have f4 lens, just use f4. If you have f2.8 lens, just use that. Try to keep your subject as far as possible from the background, you know, the more the distance, the creamier the background. Uh, try to try to pick a location where your background is even. You know, you don't have a lot of distractions. You don't have yellows and blacks and blues and oranges. You just have a nice green or a nice yellow or whatever that is. Uh, but these are some of the things. Again, just understand that not everything will be in your control. You know, uh, so if you're shooting at a natural place, uh, you have a perch set up or a feeder set up then try to do some of these things. Now, I'm shooting at home right now. I was sharing this with uh, some of my folks on Instagram the other day. I cannot control uh, a lot of the background in my, at my place, right? So because I have a backyard, but I have I also have fences in the backyard. So what I did was because I was shooting at home and there's just, just a fun project I'm doing for uh, temporarily, I put a fake piece of cloth, a green cloth in the background and just put the feeder like six feet away from it. And now every time I shoot from my, my window, I get a very clean background, you know? So it's it's nothing much. I mean, I get some very regular birds like the white winged doves and cardinals and some of the regular birds. And I'm just taking pictures just to see what happens and just because I want to keep shooting. But yeah, these are some of the things that you can look for. But definitely, number one, highest aperture that you have in your lens, f2.8, f4, 5.6, whatever that is. Um, and having the subject a little far from your uh, back. So I hope Netaji is clear with his yeah. question. Yeah. So, uh, awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. And I really wish to continue you know, spreading the awareness, spreading the news, whatever I can in any form. So I appreciate you getting me here. Thank you yeah. so much. And everyone who's watching, hello from Austin. Uh, thank you so much for joining. It, it's a pleasure, you know, it, it's an honor and it's a pleasure and for spending all this time and uh, going into the, you know, the depth of the subject and giving every details of every step which you follow, which yeah. you know, not everybody do that. So um, we are really thankful. Happy to share. As well as, 
you know. And if someone wants to know more about Supreet or his work, we we do have that interview uh, in our magazine. Yeah, magazine now. Live today, uh, postrails. dot com slash magazine. Uh, the latest edition in uh, the interview, the cover story is from Supreet. So, yeah, you can read a, uh, read a little more, and if you think you have many images, you definitely have the social media handle, which which is already yeah. added in to the posters which we have shared. And if you would like to read some stories and uh, some images, definitely check the magazine. You have the whole story in front of you. Thank so, you, Supriya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. Okay. Ciao. Bye bye. Ciao. Yeah. So that was an amazing, amazing session uh, from Supreet and um, beautiful oh, words yeah. from uh, Costa Rica, Ecuador, yeah. and all the South American places. You that you feel like you know you have already been there. You have seen the place. Now it's now it's let's hope. Let's hope. Now it's craving for me to travel. Yeah, it is. <laughs> To be honest, it is. Let's hope there is some vaccine or some solution for the current scenario, and uh, life gets back to normal, and we can travel. Let's let's hope. Yeah. Um. So that's one thing, and the other thing is the next session is going to be a new one, which is we are going to introduce an artist who is. creating magic with a piece of paper a tiny piece of paper and some colors and some scissors and paper cutting so it's a miniature paper art artist it's a couple uh, nayan and um, uh, you have the details in the uh, magazine as well as we are going to have the session on wednesday at the same time uh, yeah. so traditions wild art section is by them Yeah, by the so, uh, magazine wild art se- section you can go and see their work we have yes. a small interview about them yes and uh, they are very you know it's um, sometimes the 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 work if you see if you go check the magazine and if you check the edition and you will be able to see the work it's so unbelievable that you see the picture you don't understand whether it is a picture whether it is a painting or it's actually a real thing which they have put up it's a photo so uh, stay tuned it's a new section all together and they are also in, the, in in the same mission of spreading awareness they are, they have a project they are going to talk about that and they are going to share what they are doing so that's the next one and next saturday we nine, have nine in vaishali right uh, yeah nine in vaishali and in vaishali it's a with it's, um, it's an amazing journey of uh, you know especially when you have a partner uh, when they are a couple and share the same passion it's nothing like that um so based in ahmedabad gujarat yeah, in india in india and uh, check the magazine check their work uh, it it's not it it will be another interesting segment how how which all you know Uh, which all stream we can use to connect with nature and influence people yeah and uh, so that's our new section to connect again photography is an art so we are using different channels of art to connect with people and influence them to get closer to nature yeah. and another one is our uh, magazine the latest edition we are very happy that uh, four years ago exactly at this time we started with this magazine and uh, the whole idea was like everybody want to be a part of the Ma- national geography bbc sanctuary asia you know magazines like this but even if your works are extremely good it's not that everybody get an opportunity and we have seen it and that was one side of it giving creating a platform the second was like you know you have all these images you have different stories there are millions of people across the world so if we can connect with people using whatever we we learn or we uh, connect with people and get it it's it's a lot of work but then the end result is like in um, in last four years time we started one more magazine so we run two online magazine and the first one touched four years journey today so we would four like completed. yes four years completed that is like 20 uh, 24 editions so we publish yeah. it like by one period with a thought 
on how we can uh, like how to use our images wisely to connect with yeah. people and bring them more closer to nature and build more awareness on conservation on how important it is to conserve this nature wildlife and all the species that's yeah. how it started and a couple of good photographers good uh, humans joined with us and we made a team now yeah. it's more than 200 people along with us volunteering yeah. for this magazine and there is a core team of four to five people who are yes i definitely hours, thank them hours working on this yes yes so there is uh, there is hank um, hank taylor he's an artist and he's a scientist there is uh, Peter Hudson, again, a scientist and a photographer. Then Cynthia, an artist, uh, again, a science back from science background, so scientist. Um, and in fact, we were working. She was awake till 12 o'clock uh, last night. So um, then Rahul, who is the sub-editor from India. Then um, uh, Nitya, who is doing uh, design. She's my sister. So she she is again in India. And then Atira, who helped us with um, um, uh, proofreading and um, taking some support us in our social media content. So it's uh, it's not one or two people. We start it started between us. Then the core team kind of developed into uh, six seven people, and then now in this four years time we have it's it, you know it's not that easy to connect to two hundred and fifty plus photographers or scientists or writers or you know, people from different uh, channels to come together for one course and working on this project for four years without expecting anything else. That's that is the strength. Initially, in that. our magazine was almost 100 pages and now it has turned out turned out to oh my. Th almost 300 plus pages. And 334 and pages, man. I was going. That is the, you know, initially when we were struggling to come up with 100 pages the images and things now we have content for next two years ahead and we are trying to see how can we reduce it to 200 250 pages because every day, every day we are getting a lot of images uploaded in our website postfails.com people are uploading uh, images and great content that is the that is the main thing yes all the world and, and we have the contributing editors in each continent as well. So they are coordinating it very well. Yes, like Cynthia, um, like Rahul. So if you are in some part of the world and you would like to be our contributing editor, please get in touch with me or touch with us, myself or Hermes or through our social media page. Um, uh, you, will be, uh, you will be in touch regionally with the people who are uh, known for photography and art or uh, science in related to um, conservation and photography and uh, you can collect the stories and share with us so it's a free platform the idea is to connect people with nature use the images and stories and um, it's a uh, it's about building awareness and creating a at the same time creating the, a platform for photographers and writers so it's a combination of multiple elements so yeah, we, even though the end product is very beautiful, there is a lot of hard work behind it from like end of the month, we need to deliver the uh, magazine from the beginning of the month, we need to start working on it. Yes. It takes like a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of, uh, <laughs> lot of engagements with artists, photographers, a lot of yes. Yes. lot of revisions, a lot of corrections. It takes a lot of time and and uh, you know it but, but at the end, on the it, first of every month when that products come out yes it's, it's like a beautiful feeling for us as yeah. well and we want to thank you all thank every one of you who have been yeah. supporting us in this journey because the encouragement from your side is what is pushing us to uh, do more and keeping making us believe that by quitting our job and getting into a struggle with life we are still on the right path and we are doing certain things i mean we are we are doing the right things and we are in the right path because quitting a job from a, anybody coming from a middle class background is not a not a joke 
so it was a very hard decision it is still a hard decision but then the kind of encouragement what you guys are giving and the mission and the vision what we have is to is to connect people with nature with whatever work we can do so that's the whole i do you to spread this to more people and ask them to uh, share it with their fam- friends and family and uh, subscribe to our youtube channel yeah postal so official yeah. and you have more stories if you would like to share your images and uh, your stories in the magazine go to the website postal.com and contribute button is there you can register and contribute your images articles and everything yes yes we have a request from kaldun uh, i would like to suggest if you can arrange a session to explain to people how we can contribute and spread awareness about wildlife this will help people to feel the values of their wildlife photography it's a good suggestion i think definitely we we will uh, be in in see as we said we are going to we thought we will do one session a month but then i mean one session a week but we are going ahead with two session a week so it's going to be on every wednesdays and every saturdays um so in one of these sessions uh, we will definitely discuss this khalid uh, mm-hmm. khaldun so so that you know we are we are also trying different things uh, exploring and trying to see what are the new things what we can do in education or in connecting people with nature or in creating a, a platform uh for like minded people so that it start from us it start from you and me it start from our home from our friend circle and then it spread so that's the way it it works from simple simple steps so yeah. on that note uh, next uh, wednesday is going to be nayan and vaishali a beautiful artist beautiful if, if you go to instagram and check for nayan and vaishali you can see this couple and their beautiful work and you have our magazine postels postels.com/magazine check the latest edition in the wild art section you can see this for supreet you can check the cover story and you can see his images and we have around 15 articles from across the world so from the uh, from for for 14 different people sharing their experience to different galleries everything is for one mission to connect people with nature and for that we need all your support for each and every one of you and um, whoever is supporting us so far in our journey we really thank you from on behalf of us and for, on behalf of the whole team so thank you so much for that so it's covid time please stay safe use mask uh, use social distancing and um, stay in touch on that note bye 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 bye